Good evening and welcome to the Ford Hall Forum. My name is Mary McTighe and I am Vice President of the Forum's Board of Directors. Tonight we are pleased to be able to present to you the views of several notable journalists who will offer their report cards on how the media tells the news. Before having the pleasure of introducing our moderator, I would like to take a moment to briefly describe the Ford Hall Forum for those of you who may be attending one of our programs for the first time. The Ford Hall Forum was established in 85 years ago in 1908 and has been offering the greater Boston community an opportunity to hear the views of men and women who are shaping our community, our nation, and our world. Over the years, we have presented literally hundreds of speakers whose ideas span the political spectrum, and each program has also offered the public a chance to question, challenge, and react to the views at the forum. While we are committed to making our programs accessible to the community at large by offering programs that are both open to the public and free of charge, while we have experienced tremendous success in our programming, our fundraising efforts have not been as successful. The rising costs of continuing our tradition of free public debate make our efforts a greater and greater challenge, one which we can only hope to meet with your support. The forum membership table is located at the entrance of the building, and I would urge you to visit the table, find out what the upcoming programs are, and make as large a contribution as you can afford. You have already demonstrated your support for the forum through your attendance here tonight, and I urge you to financially support the forum at whatever level you can. Before we begin tonight's discussion, let me note that the next Ford Hall Forum program will be this Sunday, October 24th at 7 p.m. at Northeastern's University Blackman Auditorium. Joining us will be editor and essayist Roz Roger Rosenblatt, who will be discussing why he believes journalism has failed to tell the news. <clears throat> and now on to tonight's program. Our moderator this evening is Lewis Lappin, who is editor of Harper's Magazine and is certainly one of the most pro prolific authors and essayists of our times. Along with a monthly essay for Harper's Magazine, Mr. Lapham has written a large number of publications, written for a large number of publications, including Life, Forbes, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, and Vanity Fair. Mr. Lapham is also the author of several books and has published his most recent book, The Wish for Kings, this past May. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Lapham, who will introduce the rest of our guests this evening. Mr. Lappin. I'm delighted to be here, and I'm delighted to have uh, the distinguished gentleman to my left. Tonight, we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to start, I hope, a conversation among the four of us uh, on the subject as to whether the media collectively is too aggressive or too docile and whether it, is, it serves the interests of the people of the United States or whether it serves the interests of the government of the United States. And I don't know what anybody is going to say, but I, I hope that what this becomes is a conversation which we will conduct for about an hour. And at the end of that hour, questions, uh, anybody who wants to ask any question of any Everybody on the panel should come to that microphone in the center because that's the one that everybody else can hear and that's the one that the television camera can also see and we will take questions for at least half an hour. To my immediate left is, is Marty Nolan. Marty Nolan is associate editor of the Boston Globe. Before that, the Washington bureau chief for the Boston Globe and also at one point the editor of the editorial page of the Boston Globe, a very knowledgeable and uh, sophisticated student of public affairs as well as of the American uh, profession of journalism. Les Payne is the managing editor of Newsday, which is a 
very large and important paper that sometimes gets overlooked in New York, but it's, it's a marvelous newspaper. He has won at least two Pulitzer Prizes that I know of, and at the moment he's writing a book on Malcolm X. Again, a very accomplished journalist who's had many years in the profession, has written a column, and has been a foreign correspondent. Christopher Hitchens is a uh, columnist for The Nation magazine, as well as a columnist for Vanity Fair. He, at one point, was a columnist for Harper's Magazine. He, too, has written uh, a number of books, and I believe has a new one out, a book of essays this, this month, or the, certainly this fall. And all of these, uh, the gentlemen have views, and I guess I will begin with Mr. Nolan, who's our Boston representative and closer to the spirit of Sam Adams than, than maybe anybody else. So as to the question, is the press too aggressive or too docile, how do you answer that, or do you think that's a ridiculous way to begin? <laughs> well, I'll begin with a, a story. I knew a young woman once who was um, <coughs> being interviewed for a job at the New York Times by the then managing editor A.M. Rosenthal, A. Rosenthal. And he said to her, what, what's the, um, what part of the Times do you really enjoy? What, what, what's the section that you really like? And she said, well, you know, I always look at the corrections. I always mm -hmm. like those. So in that spirit, I would begin with the corrections. And it is uh, significant because media is a plural noun. The media are, the media they, not the media it is, the media they are. And the reason this is important to me is that about oh, 23, 24 years ago, I had the uh, highly entertaining but otherwise unfortunate task of covering Spiro T. Agnew, then the Vice President of these United States, going around the country uh, tossing calumny and uh, lies and balderdash around the country. And he was accompanied by two talented wordsmiths, one William Sapphire and the other Patrick J. Buchanan. And they concocted the notion that media, which heretofore had been a technical term in the advertising business, was to be their substitute for the word press. Because they knew, as a Bill Sapphire novel later confessed, that freedom of the press was a kind of a cozy notion that most Americans had, but media was wonderful. You could have they. What you could do with media is squeeze <laughs> all of your conspiracy theories into it. You could have McNeil Lara on the same plane as Geraldo Rivera. You could have National Enquirer in the New York Times and Newsday in the Washington Post writing as with one pen. So media, they are. And with that preface, I would say the media, they are rarely too aggressive and always too docile. You agree with that, Les? The simple answer is yes. Uh, but before I stake out my turf, as it were, uh, I'm, I'm, I feel left hanging. Did she get the job? Of course not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good question. <laughs> Hey, Rosenthal, are you kidding? I wouldn't no. think so, but I didn't want to. Uh, my Newsweek, though. Not... I, I didn't want to presume that, but uh, <laughs> knowing Abe, I, I figured that she did not get the job. But having said that, uh, <clears throat> kind of stake out my turf. I'm uh, assistant managing editor. Thanks for the promotion. Uh, I'm the assistant managing editor uh, at Newsday, and I'm responsible for national and international news which is to say national editor and a foreign editor work for me and I for the editor of the paper. Uh, having said that, in terms of the, the, the question on the table, I deal with reporters and have been for the last 12 years. 12 years before that, I was myself a reporter, uh, as was said during the introduction. And uh, in my, all of my dealing over the years with reporters in the field and at home, I have never, ever, ever had the occasion to tell one uh, to be less aggressive. Uh, on the contrary, uh, I think our role to often as, as editors is to tell them to be a bit more aggressive uh, and to come uh, to, 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 to the issue more, 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 more directly. Uh, I think that 
if anything, you know, the media is, 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 I wouldn't say it's too docile, but I would certainly say that it's not aggressive enough. And I think it is not aggressive enough for reasons that hopefully we'll get into uh, tonight. If we, uh, I would say 10 years ago, uh, had been asked that question, I think uh, I know that I would have, and most of the editors that I'm aware of, uh, would stand very boldly with the chest out, uh, arms akimbo, and say, you know, that uh, we are proud and uh, uh, independent and insulated. Uh, from the business side of our given newspapers, and I should say that I'm speaking for the newspaper business. I don't know too much about television and radio, except as competitors. But I think a lot has happened and a lot is happening. We're in a period of transition. And I think that in the old days, uh, when we used to proudly say that uh, we had no fear uh, of the business manager or the business side, those days, for now at least, you know, are not with us. And I think uh, we can get into that later on as for some of the reasons uh, uh, why we do the things we do. Uh, before I go to you, Christopher, let me just ask both of you a question. I mean, you, you both said, and I, and I think too, that it's not uh, aggressive enough or it's not off, you know, if it fails, it fails on that side. What do we mean by aggressive? What do we mean by aggressive is uh, our job is to, uh, you know, print the truth and raise hell, uh, we're not supposed to be docile. I mean, I, I, I can't imagine that anyone say, oh, yes, I have a swell time being docile. Uh, uh, but you I, hear a lot of people complain in the general public. They say that, pre that the press is too nasty or it's too mean or it's uh, insulting all those fine fellows in office or you know, and so yeah, on. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> you see, that, that's why I, I really think when you hear the word media and it is used as a singular noun, it's being used by either a victim or purveyor of political propaganda. Uh, it is the propaganda of politicians to say that the press is a terrible, nasty bunch of people and uh, they don't, they, all they care about is ratings or circulation and so forth, whereas, of course, every congressman, governor, mayor, senator, president is nothing but a, you know, a, a fine, you know, untainted heir to the tradition of Adams, Jefferson, and so forth. Well, you know, that ain't so. My view is, I, I think we have to <clears throat> come to some understanding in, in our individual ways what we mean by news. Uh, and I think that I, I buy into the notion that, that news is important information, factually verified, that someone very powerful wants to keep secret, uh, and that everything else is advertisement. Uh, and along that line, I think a lot of what we put in the newspaper is advertisement. So what I mean when I say that we're not being aggressive enough in the pursuit of the news, uh, I mean that if you take the example, for instance, of uh, Desert Storm, in which uh, you had 1,700 reporters at a given time, and sometimes more, running around essentially at the beck and call of the Pentagon. And my view is that if we, we were to pursue properly that story, we would have done a whole lot more. We would have been a great deal more aggressive in covering that story uh, than some of us were. Now, I, by the way, uh, I'm not knocking my own paper because I think we went back and did and found out what we could not find out during the course of, of the war. So I think that we're not being aggressive enough in finding out that information, for instance, that the government that we are charged, whom we are charged to watch, wants to keep secret. Christopher? Well, um, I became a journalist mainly because I didn't want to have to rely on the press for information. Uh, and I <laughs> have tried to be true to this precept. Um, I'm, I try every day, every day, when I open my New York Times, I try every day to see, to test my nervous ganglia and see if it, it still makes me want to throw up that on the front of this paper appears the, I, I, the slogan, all the news that's fit to print. And every morning it infallibly does. And if it's not doing that to you, by the way, you're getting habituated. Um, that such a cretinous slogan should appear on the front of a newspaper of record at the behest of its owners is a daily reminder of the sort of thing one's up against. I too am fascinated with the um, ideology of the corrections box in the New York Times. Um, my view is that the purpose of pu publishing that corrections box in such a prominent space is to assure you that everything else that appeared in the New York Times the previous day was gospel truth. If you believe that, see me afterwards also. Now I'd like to just read you um, from the transcript that I brought with me of This Week with David Brinkley on ABC, uh, Sunday 5th of, of September. I won't read from it for long, I promise. But um, Mr. James Baker is on, former Secretary of State. And as you may remember, Mr. Arafat and Mr. Perez and Mr. Rabin have just been making nice on the White House lawn. 
And the question is, how do we prevent it getting embarrassing? Because James Baker is being asked questions about his enormous and newly acquired business interests in Kuwait, the 19th province of Iraq, as it was once known, um, liberated by force of American arms, in which Mr. Baker is now a leading tycoon. And this is an awkward question, as you can see. And Koki Roberts is there to ask it. And George Will is there to make sure that the question is asked properly. And Sam Donaldson's there to see fair play. And David Brinkley's in the chair. And Baker flatly refuses to answer the question as to whether or not there's any connection between his profiteering in Kuwait and his position as George Bush's Secretary of State. So Mr. Brinkley decides something's got to be done here. And he says, and I quote, well, let me say before we go that we all know you were involved at the beginning of these peace talks. And we, no, I, I congratulate you, Mr. Baker. Thank you, David. Mr. Brinkley, hope it works out well. Mr. Baker, thank you. Mr. Brinkley, thank you very much for coming. Pleasure to have you. Mr. Baker, thank you. Nice to be here. <laughs> I don't know whether you would say this was lapdog or watchdog, um, <laughs> but I think that the, the, those are the two, uh, as were canines, to, to bear in mind, because I believe myself that the, rela that the relationship of the press to power is basically a sadomasochistic one. Um, prisoner, as it is, of the powers that be, and knowing itself to be a prisoner of the powers that be, and acting as it did in the Gulf War, and as, as it does at every White House press conference, as basically, and Russell Baker put this once very well in, in describing why he resigned as a Washington correspondent for his paper, acting as what Baker called a megaphone for frauds most of the time, there's an occasional desire to show a bit of form and a bit of independence. The, the, you know, there's, there's a, a writhing within the bonds I'll just, I'll, I mustn't overrun my time, but you probably um, saw recently the guy called Vince Foster uh, killed himself in Washington. I thought that his suicide, if that's what it was, um, perfectly exemplified uh, G.K. Chesterton's definition of uh, the role of the press. The role of the press, said G.K. Chesterton, is to tell the public that Lord X is dead when they had not known Lord X had ever been alive. <laughs> Don't mean to sound callous about Mr. Foster, but he was a Washington fixer, formerly an Arkansas fixer. He'd asked for the job. He was paid well to do it. Something made him kill himself. The press divided instantly into those who thought, we've done it to him, we the press, we've driven him to it. We're so inquisitorial, we never give authority a rest. We are forever demanding too much of our government and of, the, of our rulers. That is really like the story of O in reverse, if you ask me. And between those who said, cloaking everything in sentiment that the, the good Mr. Foster was someone too good really to have governed us, too innocent, too naive, too all-American, unprepared for the cynical brutalities of Washington, D.C. This is a sickly, a sickly and deplorable state of affairs in which um, uh, wrongdoing, uh, if, if it is not unpunished, will be praised. Would you care to comment on that, Marty? I mean, you, would you have pursued the Vince Foster story more intensely than, uh, say, well, the Times did or the I Post? I can't help thinking of, uh, oh, a few weeks ago, uh, Billy Sutton, who was a local uh, fellow who worked for the Kennedys and whose involvement in local politics antedates Tip O'Neill's rise and James Michael Curley in that era. And I saw him over here near the Parker House not too long. And he said, you know, Patsy Mulkern died last week. And I said, no kidding, Billy. Jeez, what age was he? What? He said, he was 92. I said, really? He said, Yes, politics killed him. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, that, <laughs> that happens, you know. I mean, uh, Vincent Foster died for our sins. I'm not quite sure. I, I mean, um, these aberrations, which become news stories, I, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not too fond of conspiracy theories generally. I mean, I'm very interested in them. I think they're very amusing and so forth. But... My experience has always been with every scandal that I've ever seen, and you name it, uh, assassinations, uh, Watergate, Chappaquiddick, and so forth, what we know already is bad enough, you know? And if you keep on peeling it, you don't find anything much worse than what we know already. So I, I guess on that score, whether Mr. Foster died of his own hand or some other way, I guess I can't get my radar screen uh, flipping away on it. Though actually your old uh, rival, um, William Sapphire, who was in his time a great uh, valet du pouvoir, as we say in English, um, <laughs> was one of the few people to try and raise the alarm about the Vincent Foster thing and try and 
puncture the atmosphere of self-pity and ask a few questions, but I think he, I think he drowned in the attempt. Well, I, I don't know what there was in the way of a s story there. I mean, but the idea that we should all be beating our breasts and say, oh, aren't we terrible mm. people for haunting this fine man to death? I, don't, I don't, didn't join that particular uh, wailing wall. Well, I mean, my own sense of it is that the, 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 the sorry, I got almost said the media again, the, uh, the press. <laughs> Uh, divides into different categories. There's the very big press, which are the large newspapers, the television networks, and the, uh, it's the news magazines. And then as you shade down into the, into the magazines of, and papers of smaller circulation, it, it be, uh, they become more distinct. But my, where I see the, the lack of aggression is in the, the failure to question the, something like let us take either NAFTA or the uh, uh, health care. The health care story is being, I mean, the insurance companies, as I understand it, uh, were taken care of a long time ago so that the notion of a single payer or a government payer or somehow a health care system that excludes the insurance companies is not even a subject of discussion, at least not as I read the Washington news accounts and, and hear it on the, on the television in, in the evening. So that that question was solved or uh, answered last March uh, in private conversation behind closed doors with Mr. Magaziner and his friends, and that doesn't even come up. So now the way that the story is being played is the politics of how to get this bill through. It, it, it doesn't, as I read the, the papers that I read, and see the television, we're not talking about uh, what a health, uh, why we're doing this, or raising questions about uh, priorities, and, and uh, maybe there is not a cure for death, and maybe there is no perfect answer to this, and so forth, but we're talking about the game that's being played of it becomes a political uh, ballet, which is very much of interest to the people that uh, in Washington and their uh, friends and associates in the, in the relevant industries, but of not much interest, I don't think, to the, to the American people at large. That's what I mean by the lack of aggression, the, the, uh, the unwillingness on the part of uh, uh, too many columnists or reporters to offend the, their sources or to ask very rude questions uh, when present at White House press conferences or, or as uh, on the, the Brinkley show. I mean, the, here is Baker, who's over there as a lobbyist in Kuwait. I mean, if you read the Seymour Hearst piece in The New Yorker, and very large interests in rebuilding the uh, electrical capacities of Kuwait, and, and just to go through that business is, is is what, to me, to my mind, uh, the press too often does. I think that's true. I, I think that within that uh, uh, healthcare question that, that you're framing there, I think there's also, as in some of these other shortcomings, uh, kind of false assumptions. There's not that healthy skepticism. There, you don't begin with perhaps the lobbyists will continue to make the money. Perhaps, you know, the vested interest will continue to profit from this thing despite what we're told. And I think that most of the uh, uh, kind of uh, insipid reporting that we end up with, I think, begins from the inside with, with bad assumptions, with lazy assumptions, and, and I think it grow out of a number of reasons. One of them is that I think there's a, there's a kind of a homogeneity uh, between the people who are covering and the people who are covered. I think that we, we've arrived at a point now when I got into the business uh, uh, journalism, the newspaper business, again, magazine writers pay, get paid a lot more, but the, uh, the, the newspaper business were, uh, newspaper reporters were paid very little. And so we were getting people who came out of uh, uh, lower paying jobs. They were, some of them were, were literate, <laughs> most of them were, but some were not. I mean, in 1969, when I entered this business, we had reporters who could barely write and would call their story into the rewrite person. But since Woodward Bernstein made this a respectable craft, I'm talking about the newspaper business again, we've begun to get a higher level, a better educated 
uh, group of people. And I think that when you look at the reporters who are being watchdogs on these politicians, we find that they are drawn from pretty much the same source. I mean, they live in the same exclusive neighborhoods. They grew up in the same neighborhoods. They have basic, the same assumptions about thing, things. They, uh, the, they, they eat in the same exclusive restaurants uh, and, and on expense accounts in both cases. Uh, and, and, and they use the same blow dryer. And so I think that when you have no disparity between those who are being covered and those who are doing the covering, I think you begin to get uh, a, 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 a huge problem. Uh, uh, the other th side of it, I think, also is that these sources are very seductive. I mean, uh, usually a good, aggressive reporter begins by covering the police department. And the first thing the police department wants to know is, who is this young reporter? that's covering the police department. Then they began to seduce them, and then that reporter moves from there to cover the county government, and then he or she makes his or her way to Washington. And by that time, all too often, though not in all cases, what we've had is this person has been wrung out. And so by the time, of course, David Brinkley started, you know, the last, well, uh, generation, let's say, to be kind. But, uh, you know, I think there's a sameness. There is, there is an assumption, or the same assumption between Brinkley and Bakley, Baker, I think. And I think that is, that, that is a problem that we, we we're working with as editors. Before I go to you, Christopher, just let me amplify that. With yes. the, the, the most marvelous show that I saw last, during the election, was to, to prove Les's point, was a, was a front line, GBH front line with Bob Coolwich. And he was standing outside a condominium in Boca Raton, Florida, and he's in the foreground, and, the, and the, the condo is behind him, and he starts going down. He points out who owns the apartments on each floor, and the top floor is owned by a fellow. I can't get them all, but I get most of them. There is a fellow named Dwayne Andreas, who is the chairman of a company called Archer Daniel Midland, which is a big grain company, which supports, uh, among other programs, uh, Washington Week in Review. The second apartment is, is Brinkley. And we go right through it. I mean, there's the uh, Foley has an apartment, Dole, um, a guy, the, 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 the fellow whose name I can never remember, who's the big AFL CIO union fellow, Donaldson, uh, Will, um, a couple of other politicians. And it just goes straight down. And it just went down the, uh, you know, the outside of the building. And it, it shows exactly. Uh, what Les was saying. I mean, when you're, most of the time, when you're talking to senior, uh, I almost said media, press people, you are, in my view, you're, you're, I'm, I'm talking to the government. Hey, excuse me, uh, Christopher, your turn. I was going to say that I think that um, the, it's the subliminal uh, manipulation that may be the most brilliantly done. I mean, everybody knows that there is a guy called David Gergen who, even as you sleep, is sleepless on your behalf in making sure that his version of events enters your field of consciousness. As far as I know, he's paid from public funds, so you ought to demand more of him than perhaps you do. Um, now doing this job for one presidency, did it for Ronald Reagan. Um, the, aim of, uh, the, the ideal aim of an American sitting president is this, is to get a good press for getting a good press. He wants a write-up for what a good press he's getting. You, it's very seldom you can actually get that. Reagan did get it with Gergen. Clinton has not yet got a good press for getting a good press, but he's, I think, sometimes well on the way to doing it. How do you do it? You get the press to refer to things the way you do. This is why Russell Baker resigned and said, I don't want to be a megaphone for frauds. For, for example, James Baker, or now Warren Christopher, whenever they leave on a mission to the Middle East, it's described the Secretary of State leaves today on a peace mission to the Middle East. That's yet to be proved, ladies and gentlemen. That's for us to judge. We'll be the judge of that. It's only surely in banana republic countries that the broadcasting praises and makes the assumption uh, that the, uh, the government is always on, in the right. Um, today, President Clinton uh, called in lawmakers to discuss passing his stimulus package. Who says it's a stimulus package? Clinton says it is. Why does the press have to say it for him? Now, Mr. Clinton faces an uphill battle for his health care reform program. Who says it's a reform when it's a capitulation to the insurance companies? Well, every, every newspaper and electronic outlet in the country says it. That's why. And why do they do that? Because there is a paid courtier in the White House whose job it is to make sure that's the way it's reported. Now, really, uh, we, it's not, the readers can't and listeners can't, viewers can't be blamed necessarily for taking this in 
uh, and perhaps I, I, maybe I'm being pessimistic, perhaps they don't, they shouldn't, but I think the people who pass it on undigested through the megaphone deserve the most unsparing criticism every time. Let me ask you, Les, you, you brought up uh, earlier in your first comment about the, the, the overhanging weight of business interests or money or advertising, and you contrasted that to a situation 10 years ago. I mean, if you, if you agree with, with, with what Christopher is saying, has it gotten worse over the last 10 years? And if it's gotten worse, why has it gotten worse? Well, there's recession uh, is one of the realities. I think another reality is, is that uh, major media conglomerates have been busily over the last 10, 15 years gobbling up individually, privately owned newspapers. Again, newspapers is what I know. And, and I think that uh, what drives corporations who are beginning increasingly to own uh, large numbers of newspapers, profits. And, and, and this is not what the First Amendment is about. I think that uh, it's not a conflict that we face every day, but it is one that kind of looms, particularly uh, when there is a recession and when the profits are bad and when we begin to close bureaus and reduce staffs. So this is a reality that we are facing in the newspaper business to have been, at least for the last three or four years. Well, I, I certainly felt that this morning. It was, I, I guess this morning I looked at the New York Times and there's a picture on the page one of the business section and you see all of these leading uh, cable and um, telephone, uh, Viacom, Bell Atlantic, and so forth, these great giant lizard-like uh, trusts. And there's not a peep about the antitrust law. I mean, you see what's happening with the Bell Atlantic deal, or you see what's now the, the, the kind of people that are arguing to buy Paramount. Uh, sooner or later, what happens is there's one cable into your house, and that's the only one there is. And Somebody, I mean, and, and what goes on that cable is somebody else's decision. And this is all praised this morning as uh, the wonders of modern technology, and, and nobody, or at least not the Times, uh, raises the, the, the antitrust notions or tries to work out the implications uh, that, that Les just mentioned. And I, I mean, to me, that's. Uh, Shocking. Well, I would offer an ideological dissent. Uh, you know, I, I really think that the explosion and pro proliferation of media outlets is all to the good. I mean, aren't uh, I'm not But they're going to be controlled by one person, I mean, or by uh, very few. I mean, I agree with you that if it was a genuine explosion, wonderful. But the control is, uh, is maybe in the bill you pay, but. I mean, having C-SPAN 1, C-SPAN 2, ESPN 1, and ESPN 2, I think it's a big improvement over having just CBS, ABC, and NBC. I mean, which of course now are the life looking colliers of, a, of um, the American scene. I mean, they're on their way out, they're dinosaurs. I think the proliferation, uh, soon, very soon, you'll be able to have a gizmo in your pocket and you can punch up the Associated Press and the United Press and Reuters and and uh, get your own news. Uh, I think this is a big change. And I, uh, the fact that one cable company is going to control it, I don't think that's going to be so, by the way. I think the, the telephone, I think when it's all said and done, the telephone companies and the cable companies will be competing with each other uh, to some degree. So I, I don't, uh, I think cable television is better than uh, three channels. I, I agree with that. I'm just afraid it's going to come back into one channel instead of three. Well, I, Maybe I'm I, an alarmist. Yeah, I, I'm not that worried. I, it's the quality of the stuff. It's, it, I, mean, I hate to get back to language, but George Orwell, his famous essay on politics in the English language published in 1946 is, is uh, worth uh, this and the next six dozen uh, discussions of the media. And he said, language is in our time, political language in our time is the defense of the indefensible. And it is true, as Christopher says, every bad, terrible cliche that the White House flax come up with is just parroted and echoed throughout. Managed care. What the heck does it mean? Nobody seems to know. But it's, it's just a, a, an echo chamber of, uh, of propaganda. And that's a fact. But I think the cure for that is more outlets and not fewer. 
Well, oh, what, what about it in your capacity as editor of newspaper? I mean, can you or can less? I mean, in comes the, the story, the file, and, and there's the terrible phrase, reform, managed care, oh, yeah. well, peace I, mission. What do you do? To, can, you, can you call up? Can you take the blue pencil at that point? Yeah, I particularly despise the word reform. I, when I was an editor, I told people under, if you don't use the word reform with quotation marks, you are not going to get much more in this newspaper. I mean, I said, Reform without quotation marks. It, it is an absolute loaded propaganda word. Everyone's for reform. But one man's reform is another man's loophole. I mean, tax reform means uh, <laughs> my activities are protected by the internal revenue and yours are taxed. I mean, tax reform, oh boy, there's two loaded words. So whenever you see the word reform and, the, and somebody hasn't used quotation marks, somebody is trying to swindle you. Well, that's a very helpful hint on how to read the newspapers because most newspapers I know don't put it in quotation marks. Can you, I mean, if your reporters are re aggressive, Wes, as you said, I mean, what happens to their aggression when it comes into the office? Is the aggression uh, modified, uh, dampened down? I mean, does something happen to that, you know, the, the snarling dog is out there barking at the heels of power, and, and what happens when it comes into the office? Of course not at Newsday, but everywhere else. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I think that uh, uh, reporters are the key to this business, as far as I'm concerned. And, and they're not only other people on the front lines, as it were, they're the people who you can sit you know, behind the desk as editors and make all of these great decisions and, and they never really get acted upon you know, unless a reporter brings it in. I mean, I think talking about the, uh, I know we, we're kind of scanning a lot here, but getting back to the, uh, to the Iraq war, at the end of the day, well, even before the end of the day, at the beginning of the day, the uh, Pentagon moving on its concern about its proposition that it was immediate that loss of the Vietnam War was going to be very, very careful coming out of Grenada and coming out of uh, its other skirmishes that the media would not spoil this one uh, uh, for the boys. So what they did is they had these tight pools that we debated, you know, at Newsday whether we should enter them or not enter them. Finally, we decided that, okay, we will send a reporter uh, on the plane, on the Pentagon plane, but we will also send two or three on the ground who can operate on their own uh, in the, in the so-called war area. But still, at the end of the day, 1,700 reporters had done their work. We still had not found out what had happened during the war. I mean, we had, I think the salient uh, uh, photograph we had was General Schwarzkopf at the blackboard with the pointer. Yeah. I mean, that was the war. And, and we also had on the, on the screen, you know, these nice little video game bombing exercises that uh, we saw through the uh, cameras of these planes. And so what we did is uh, we had uh, uh, Pat Sloan, you know, who, who was in the military, who went back and what he decided to do and what we decided to do is that this isn't over yet. So we went and we began to talk to individual soldiers. He went the breadth of this country from Seattle to Kansas to Fort Benning, and he began to talk to individual soldiers who were there. He also went to Germany and he talked to soldiers and began to piece together what happened. And what he found out uh, by aggressive reporting is some of the things that the Pentagon hid, and that is that there were a lot more deaths by friendly fire. He detailed uh, the account of what the friendly fire episodes were. He came across an incident in which the U.S. Uh, US unit was burying Iraqi soldiers alive by putting plows in front of these tanks that were driving over the battlefield. Uh, he, 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 for his efforts, won a Pulitzer Prize for it, uh, uh, for covering the war, but it's an example, I think, of even when our government goes through extraordinary uh, extremes to keep us from telling the American public what really is happening on something like a battlefield where they control access, really. I think we still have to find ways as reporters, as individual outlets, media outlets, to find out what really happened. Because it's very, very crucial that the American public know not just what their tax dollars are doing, but the people they are killing and how their own sons and daughters are, uh, are being killed. I mean, Somalia is another example. I won't get into it at the moment, but we don't know and haven't been told forthrightly and consistently enough what is happening in Somalia. But you know, there's one, I mean, I feel a sense of constraint because I think your newspaper is very good and I think its foreign coverage is one of the best things about it. Not as Pat Sloyer, but also Roy Gutman's stuff from, from Bosnia-Herzegovina, which is a, a, an imperishable bit of American reporting, in my opinion. But um, as it happens, there isn't an American correspondent. I mean, there may be an American correspondent in Somalia tonight, but there wasn't last week. 
and hadn't been for some time. Well, we have one there right now. Yeah, I'm sure this is now being re rectified, but for a long time, at the time you most needed to know, the whole, the whole coverage was being done by actually a fellow countryman of mine, a, a brother, opportunist Brit Stringer, who was sending different stories, very differently angled, depending on which newspaper he was writing for, was covering the entire waterfront and cleaning up. Um, it was actually complete, uh, straight out of Evelyn War's uh, scoop. Um, so, you know, why should it be that everything in the news, everything important comes to you as a surprise? Well, that's one of the reasons why. Um, I think that um, there are revenges for that, though. If you recall, Ronald Reagan said, it, and it's actually the only strictly truthful remark I believe he ever made, um, <laughs> that if it were not for a rag in Beirut, or as he put it, that rag in Beirut, um, Washington would never have been troubled by the Iran-Contra scandal, certainly the greatest attack on the Constitution since, um, since the Second World War. And as a matter of fact, that was completely true. Washington is stuffed with people like myself, overpaid, underworked, um, well-invited and well-liquored up around the place. Uh, none of them had thought of digging, though they knew. They knew there was skullduggery going on in Nicaragua, and they knew there was some filthy back channel to Iran, too. They didn't, they didn't do a thing about it. It was actually true that it was a, a, a newspaper in Beirut that broke the story and put the whole American press in the dark. So it can be that one foreign correspondent can make a difference not just to the um, reporting of America, but to the, uh, excuse me, to the reporting of overseas to America, but to the reporting of America to itself. And that tends to be the case. I mean, Watergate was, was two reporter, young upstarts, and when they began to write about this burglary, there were reporters, veteran reporters, Washington hands, who were questioning whether or not Woodward and Bernstein, who are they? If this really had happened, John Mitchell would have told me. Uh, and I think this is how that story got begun. I mean, we, we now brag in the, in, in the, within the media about how great the story was, but at the very beginning, the media reporters who had been covering Washington for a very long time were very, very doubtful, skeptical, and, and were criticizing the early reports. And I think that, uh, getting back to your question, I think what we have to stay alive for as editors is not so much whether someone is going to be docile and to go along, but when someone come, uh, come in with a scent, when a reporter comes in with a scent that is different from others, on the contrary, I, I tend to listen to them particularly, and uh, I'll speak for myself, and I'll, I can speak for Newsday to that degree. Uh, but I think that, number one, we don't get enough sense. So I don't want to sit here and say that it comes in every day. And number two, all too many of us uh, dismiss them, because John Mitchell would have told me if there had been a burglary uh, at the Watergate. But could I just want, sorry, Marty. Yeah. I mean, I also went to uh, Desert Storm. Actually, it was Desert Shield when I went. I went with Bush on one trip, and I, I went after the war and during it to Kurdistan and elsewhere. And I was very impressed by the way the Pentagon managed me at any rate when I went on Air Force One. And it occurred to me that since the Vietnam War, the, the Defense Department had studied the press a great deal more than the press had been studying the Defense Department. And when it became, became clear that there was going to be a war and that the Pentagon was going to demand prior restraint on reporting in violation of the Constitution, Harper's Magazine, editor and sole proprietor L. Lapham, um, The Nation Magazine, which I have the honor to write a column, the Progressive, a couple of other papers, brought mm -hmm. a suit and said, you know, we don't, whether the public wants chains on its reporting or not, and maybe the public does and did, because the press is very scared of public opinion, more than it often is of its owners. It's a plaything of populism. We don't want this, and it's not American and it's not legal. But you went around to the New York Times, and I regret to say Newsday, or many, many other newspapers to see would they join the suit, and they would not, and it went down. Um, which I think was a, a sorry day for the trade. In 1923, during the Harding administration, H.L. Mencken visited Washington from Baltimore and said, uh, said, the average Washington correspondent is a person bustling with ideas and ideals who comes to Washington determined to tell the truth. But uh, just for a few hours, he is exposed to the gaudy magnificos of the town, and all his idealism is undone. And by the end of his days, he becomes a tinhorn statesman, statesman, unable to tell the truth if he tried. Well, that was 70 years ago. This is real as rain. You could, you could put that in the paper tomorrow, and it'd be as true as anything else you read. I was a Washington correspondent for 16 years. Fortunately, my time coincided with some of the biggest frauds, fakes, and liars that the presidency had ever seen. Lyndon B. Johnson, Richard Milhouse Nixon, and on through Carter and Reagan. 
And the good news is these guys really are kind of clumsy. That is to say, the presidents and the people trying to help them. I mean, you talk about health care. I don't know if Clinton's fooling anyone. I mean, there's a guy who's got 43 percent of the vote, and he's got to get more than that if he wants to get reelected. And however good-hearted he may well be, and high-minded and intelligent and policy want to the nth degree, uh, I don't know that he can still be all things to all people, which he's trying to be. He's not devious like Johnson and Nixon, uh, but he's, you know, trying to tell everybody what they want to hear, and that's not a formula for leadership. And the press does go along. Dr. Gergen is doctor of spinology, as we know, and the spin is, is going well, but it'll sort of wear out. And I think by the time 1996 rolls around, I don't think Gergen's laurels will quite be as bright and green as they are today. Well, I go back to, I'm not sure that, it, that we ever resolve it, because I go back to the question that Les raises, which is the recession and the money angle of it. And the reporter can only be as brave as his editor. I mean, the, uh, I think of an editor of the New York World in about 1910, and he was sending a reporter to get a scandal story in the Plaza Hotel from a very rich uh, oil man. And the oil man uh, threw the reporter down the stairs of the Plaza Hotel, quite a long distance, and uh, told the editor his name was Muncie. And Muncie said, go back and tell him he can't treat me that way. Right? <laughs> so you've got to be able to back up these. If, if Les is listening to the people who come back from the press conference and have the odd turn on the, on the piece and don't hear it the way everybody else heard it, you still have to be able, you have to be able to back those people up. And if your owner, I mean, I mean, and then I think of people like Kay Graham, who in a speech to uh, the upper tier of the CIA at Langley two years ago at dinner, uh, says, well, there are just certain things the American people uh, shouldn't know and never should know and don't deserve to know. I mean, we hear, you know, you, uh, whatever the director's name was at the time, and I, and Henry Kissinger and possibly David Brinkley and George Will, because we know they'll keep their mouths shut. We can know that, but the American people can't know that. Now, if the papers are owned by those people, if, I mean, you have NBC is owned by GE, I mean, uh, you have CBS owned by Larry Tisch and so forth, and I really don't see the, uh, the surge. Uh, nobody, I don't see uh, Larry and, and Kay Graham and, uh, General Electric kind of leaving this building and uh, going down to the harbor and burning a, a ship and throwing any tea in, in, in uh, out. So I don't see how it gets any better. Um, I just think it gets uh, worse. And so that we're almost at the p I guess we can all get our last statement here before we, we, take, we take questions in about five minutes. But my conclusion is that the, the press is uh, much too docile and is likely to stay docile uh, <coughs> in any future that I, I can foresee. But you, Marty, will give a better end than that, I'm sure, I hope. Yeah, I, I, uh, if, if the press were the same as the press has been, uh, yes, but I think there's so many new venues of information. I can't imagine anyone who watches C-SPAN religiously is going to believe that the New York Times has all the news it's fit to print because they have a chance to look at the sausage factory at full shift, you know? And uh, even though what goes on in the Congress is not, will not always meet the test of truth. To see the full length of the speech, people can make their own judgments. I mean, people always say to the press, oh, you leave stuff <coughs> out. Yes, we leave, we generally leave stuff out. It's very often the most boring stuff, not the most incendiary. I mean, it, yes, there's uh, the seduction of the propagandists uh, and officialdom, but a lot of the stuff is left out just because of practical considerations. That's why I think C-SPAN is terrific. Let people see the whole pageant. You can be your own reporter when you watch CNN or C-SPAN, and it's terrific. You say, 
And you pick up the paper the next day and say, this clown missed the lead, you know, what do you, what such and such happened was really more important. So I have my faith in, uh, not in technology certainly, but, but in the judgment of people as they acquire more information. I'm optimistic because I think there, <clears throat> that there is a legitimate American, and I could extend that, to just say human need to know and a will to know. And I think that with, with the appetite there, I think we'll find a reason, not because it's profitable on, on the first instance, although I think it, it, it can be profitable. I think if you look at the, exper the experiment of, of USA Today, which is cited in, in the newspaper business as being an example of how uh, the newspaper business began to lose its mind and certainly its way. Uh, but what happened to USA Today, experimental though it was 10 years ago, is that what they found uh, recently and, uh, is that news does in fact sell. There is a market for news. I mean, they were doing these little, uh, what, what Dan Rather, and we could get into that, call was and buzz, or fuzz and was, I guess, uh, was what, what, what Dan Rather termed it recently uh, uh, for the newspaper business. But what, what USA Today discovered uh, a couple of years ago is that uh, during the uh, uh, Gulf War, for instance, that on the day they put out a special edition of this paper that had news about the war, they sold a million 300,000 extra papers on that day. They found when Magic Johnson uh, announced that he had AIDS on the next day's paper of USA Today, they sold a half a million that they would not have sold. And uh, so what they are finding is when they do news that th these papers sell, and it's not just Madonna on the cover. Uh, and I think we struggle with that in the, in the newsroom, but I, I think that there is a legitimate uh, will to know. And I think that it may not be the dominant will. I know that we go through campaigns. The campaign of 1992 uh, was a big problem when, when Ross Perot, another milestone along with USA Today, when Ross Perot found a way to come in at treetop level. Now, as, 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 as weak as our guns may be, uh, he found a way to come even lower so that he wouldn't get fired at it all. Uh, Jerry Brown had his 800 number. Uh, Ross Perot uh, had his... Uh, 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 Larry King, let's face it, uh, and went on. That's what I mean when I say treetop level. He wasn't getting any really cynical, tough questioning. Uh, and then we had politicians who picked up on it. Clinton had his videotape that he was handing out, his video cassette that he was handing out in New Hampshire. So I think that we have new sources. And, and, and the thing about Ross Perot, a man with his resources and, and his, his enterprise, can be both a newsmaker as well as news reporter and editor. And he can get in completely unfiltered and un. Uh, examined, you know, by any reporter, whether it's Larry King or whether it's uh, Dan Rather or whether it's uh, Cy Hertz. And so I think that that, on the one hand, is a problem, but I think we have to, if you will, mobilize for it, realizing that that is a problem and get out and, and, and find out what is going on. I think we have to find a way. I don't think we are doing necessarily all that well now, uh, but I think we must do better because I think that, uh, that, that it, there is a demand for it. Christopher? Um, a brief meditation, again, on one single word. Uh, the word is bipartisan. Um, I invite you to ask yourselves if you've ever seen the word bipartisan used except as a compliment. Or the word partisan uh, used except as a pejorative. I think I will not get much dissent. Why should it be that if something can be described as bipartisan is axiomatically good, this is true of the editorial coverage, um, of the headlines, of the commentary, and indeed new, it's very heavily nuances and inflects the general coverage of politics in America. And the, for someone to be accused as partisan is bad, always bad. Sounds kind of rough, mean, selfish. Study that construction, if you will, and what you hear the press saying is, Jesus Christ, if it goes on like this, there'll be two parties in this country. <laughs> now, I think that's very revealing because I think always uh, it's the unconscious that never lies. And the cat emerges from the bag, mewing at the top of its voice that this is a one-party system, which I think many of us have long suspected. But the fact that this should be what the press is in fact telling you in its treatment and usage of one word, partisan and bipartisan, is I think suggestive. I think there is indeed a one-party consensus in this country, and I think the press long ago decided to be its guarantor. And I think that is the problem and the enemy in plain view. On that cheerful and happy note, we will take questions. And you can direct your question to whoever you choose. My question, I would like an answer from all four of you. <clears throat> uh, personally, I wish the president did not even have a
press conferences. Washington, George Washington, Lincoln, and others didn't have them. So my question is, would each one of you feel that the press should boycott the presidential press conferences? Oh, I'd like to see that done. That, that, would, that, would, that would appeal to me, to see that done once at least. It's happened. It's happened. Uh, when, when Jimmy Carter was toward the end of his term, uh, I did a check, and I remember going to the press conference only because our White House correspondent said, I can't stand, I don't want to go. So I went just in case something happened. And it, that's always the case for covering the, the body watch and the president, in case something really happens. And I looked throughout about a dozen papers, and Carter had a whole press conference, and he never appeared on page one of an American paper. Competition probably won't allow it, but it may not be a bad idea. I mean, we, every four years, talk about whether or not we should not so much boycott the convention, but whether or not we should cover it. There are 15,000 people covering the convention in New York, the Democratic uh, Convention in New York, 15,000 reporters, and each of them admitting, not reporters, but journalists, and each of them admitting that there was no story. So I think some of these things we do by form and by habit, and I think that it, it, is, it has gotten to be a habit that, that, that no longer uh, fulfills the function. I think the White House press room and the right White House press spokesman should be boycotted until and unless it's paid for out of either Clinton family funds or, or Democratic Party funds and it's openly proclaimed to be what it is. The White House press room is an open scandal. It's also a very unpleasant place to be. I remember when um, in, in the Reagan years, Curtis Wilkie, a very good reporter from the Washington Post, was looking around the place. Oh, it's Boston, Boston, Boston Globe, excuse me, didn't Just, I say? Thank you. Um, <laughs> from the Boston Globe, I meant to be commenting. From, from the Boston Globe, a colleague of Marty's, um, looking around the place and said, Jesus, this room is the only daycare center in America Reagan hasn't got around to closing. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you, Marty, and last one, this one. I want to take just a second to thank Christopher Hitchens and Les Payne, Marty Nolan, and especially Lewis Lapham and Harper's Magazine for co-sponsoring this program. Our next program is being held this Sunday night at Northeastern University and features Roger Rosenblatt, essayist, author, and journalist, talking about why journalism fails to tell the news. Please join us then. Thank you. Thank you.